Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, this Thanksgiving week. Are you thankful that you're able to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Hallelujah. Thankful for all that God has done in our lives. Thankful for our church. Can we just lift him up right now? God, we love you. We thank you, Jesus, for your goodness, for your mercies. You are great, O oh Lord, and you are greatly to be praised. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Hallelujah for this church. We give you the praise for it. Amen. Worship the Lord with the praise team this morning.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. Come on, why don't you lift up your voice? Hallelujah to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We praise you, mighty God. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We praise your name, oh God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Well, if you're happy and you know it, shout amen. amen. Hallelujah. Everybody's happy today. Turn to your neighbor and greet them. Amen. And you may be seated. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's good to have everybody with us today. We greet those that are watching online also. Great audience that we have online. Amen. We're especially thankful for all of our guests that are here today. Amen. If this is your first time to be with us or even your second or third time, you're our VIPs. Amen. We have a special reception prepared for you immediately following the service. If you exit out the front foyer here, just make a left down the hallway. Or if you're going through the second foyer, make a right. Amen. And back there behind this wall over here to my left is the Connection Cafe. There's some people back there to meet you and greet you, and they have a gift back there for you. So we hope that you'll take time after the morning worship service to stop by our guest center. Amen. Well, right now, I want to turn your attentions to the screen for this week's announcements. We are excited to hold another Thanksgiving food basket drive here at East Wind. And we would love for you to get involved in helping feed families in need in our community this Thanksgiving. All you need to do is stop by an info desk after service today and select items that you can purchase and donate to a family in need. All items must be turned into the Life Center kitchen by tonight. We want to wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving this Thursday. We are so thankful that you are a part of our East Wind family. Don't forget that due to the holiday, we will have no midweek prayer and word this week. Our regular life group classes will resume after Thanksgiving. Last Sunday, we launched our vision for Go in 2020, and we released the new Go booklet. Be sure to pick up your copy today to see everything God has done through your giving to Go in 2021, and let's look ahead to our goal to continue to increase our impact in our church, our community, and our world in 2020. Please be in prayer about what you can give to Go next year. We will take up commitments on Sunday, December 5th. And when you commit to give to our GO program, you can help support vital community ministries like Hands for Healing that feeds and helps those in need locally and globally, and Candle Lighters that helps kids that are fighting cancer here in Brevard, and Liberty Council that fights for our Christian liberties and freedoms, and Pregnancy Resources of Brevard that helps pregnant teen girls avoid abortion and choose life. Also, new ministries like the Palm Bay Outpouring Crusade at Bayside High, which brings healing and salvation to our community, as well as to Glow Children's Mansion, Lighthouse Ranch for Boys, and more. Your commitment to go on Sunday, December 5th will truly make an impact in these amazing community ministries and so much more. Make plans to join us next Sunday and invite a friend as we will welcome guests speaker Mike Easter to minister in both of our morning and evening services. You are sure to be blessed by his anointed ministry. Attention all students, Holiday Youth Convention is coming up on December 27th to the 29th at the Hilton Resort in Daytona Beach with Matt Tuttle and Dexter Gordon speaking. This is going to be a great two nights of fellowship and worship and we encourage every student to attend. The cost is $175 per student, and this is open to ages 12 to 29 years old. If you are interested in going, please sign up at an info desk, and remember a deposit of $75 will be due on Sunday, December 5th. Now it is time to worship through giving, and we have a number of ways that you can give today. You can give digitally at give.eastwind.church, or you can use the app called Tidly. Or you can give by texting 321-339-1333 
or you can use the traditional offering baskets in just a few moments. And everybody say amen. amen. Have you got your Go booklets yet? Amen. The giving or generosity opportunities is what it's Go stands for. And for those of you who may not know, this is how we fund all of our ministries here at East Wind. And once a month, on the first Sunday of every month, we receive our Go offering. They have special envelopes that they have. And um, that, well, like I said, it um, funds all of our ministries. And, but it's done once a month. And uh, we don't take up offerings, special offerings all the time here. And it's just funded by your continued sacrifice and giving to the Go Ministries. Amen. So we're asking on December the 5th is when we're going to take our pledges uh, for our Go uh, program. And you will pledge what you can give either for the whole year or you can do it monthly. It's broken up however you want to do it, however you choose to give. Amen. But it will start on January the 1st, uh, January, or first Sunday in January will be our first one for our new commitments. All right, clear as mud. Everybody got that? If you have any questions, you can ask me later, but be sure to pick up your Go pamphlet. Amen. You can get it at either one of the foyers, and you can read about all the different things that we contributed to in 2021, and it'll go just what they showed here this morning on this morning video is just a small portion of what your giving goes to. We just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for your continued sacrifice. This church is doing some great things all around the world and here in our local community. I'm thankful to be a part of East Wind, aren't you? Amen. Amen. Well, why don't we all stand today? We're going to receive our Sunday morning tithe and offering. Amen. And we here at East Wind, we have a giving declaration that we say every Sunday. So let's read this together. It says, upon the authority and by the orders of your word, I have given and it shall be given to me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I bring my tithe and offering to you. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked and the curse is broken. I receive your blessings and the abundance that comes with them. I receive jobs and promotions, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, Bills paid off and debts dismissed. I decree that my whole family will be saved and walk with God in health, abundance, and in divine favor and blessings. I shall be blessed going in and I shall be blessed going out and all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. And it is so. You may be seated. God bless you this morning.
Oh, we bless you, Lord. We speak your name today. Would you lift your voice and declare the name of Jesus? We speak the name of Jesus over every situation. Come on, lift up your voice and declare the name of Jesus. There is no other name. We speak Jesus. We speak Jesus. Over every sickness, over every trial, over every difficulty. Jesus, Jesus. We speak your name. How many of you can raise your hand today and say you're thankful for the revelation of the name of Jesus? Hallelujah. There's power in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. We baptize in the name of Jesus. We pray for the sick in the name of Jesus. We speak Jesus over our kids when they have a fever late at night. We speak the name of Jesus over our marriages. We speak the name of Jesus over our cars when they won't start. Can I get a witness in the house of a Jesus name apostolic congregation? Let everything that has breath declare his name. Jesus. We give thanks to the Lord for each and every one of you. I'm so thankful that you have committed yourself to be a part of the East Wind family of believers. We are a blessed people because of each other. Jesus Christ is our common denominator. His love for us is what brings us all together. We know each other because we know him. Oh, isn't God good? I turn your attention this morning to 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 1. And while you're turning to that scripture, I want to congratulate uh, my sister, uh, Denise Johnson, for receiving her doctorate in education on Thursday. So happy for her. That's not an easy accomplishment. And I said in the early service, my sister has a doctorate in education. My mom has a doctorate in mental health counseling. And, and I have a doctorate in law. I think mine's the only one that's not very useful. But I did want to say that... Uh, my sister, my mother, and I uh, would not have um, accomplished any of that without my father who made it possible for all of us. So we give honor to Bishop Myers. And I say that because for 50 years, he really has founded this church on an unselfish leadership style that has allowed all of us to grow and accomplish whatever our dreams were. And each and every one of us benefit from that. Aren't you thankful for the heritage that we have at East Wind? God is good. Second Samuel chapter 11 and verse 1. And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab. At a time when kings go to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabah, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. Now turning your attention over to the last book in the Bible, Revelation. It's first chapter in the fifth and sixth verse, Revelation chapter one, verses five and six. Oh, I don't know about you, but I still love to hear those pages turning. I'm thankful for technology, but there's something about that sound right there. I'm just going to turn a bunch of pages for my own pleasure. Whew. Something about them pages. Get up here near my microphone so you can hear it. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests, unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. 
It's easy to run past the revelation of those two verses. But I want to remind you that Jesus Christ is the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. And because he holds that position through his blood, we are made kings and priests unto God. Amen. Juxtaposing those two passages of scriptures together into a single thought, our message today is simply kings go to battle. Kings go to battle. Would you bow your heads and pray? Lord, we are thankful to be in your house. Thankful for the opportunity, Lord, to be in your presence. You've already blessed us. We feel your presence in this place. What a privilege it is to sit in heavenly places, to be with your people, God, in this house, a house that's dedicated to your name. And now, Lord, as your word goes forth, let it marinate in our hearts, minds, and spirits. Let it change us, Lord. Let it fall on good ground and give us boldness and courage to respond to it in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated and thank you for standing. It can never be said about King David that he was afraid of a battle. He started out in life as a young man fighting for his sheep, fighting bears and lions. Soon he was fighting giants as he was still just a young teenager. He arrives on the battle scene with this giant called Goliath. This giant of a man nearly 10 feet tall, roaring out a challenge to any man that would fight. The children of Israel were in a standoff with the Philistines who seemed to be their arch nemesis. And this man was the champion of the Philistines. He was an enormous man. He had won many battles. They referred to him as the champion. And every day he would holler around a challenge, if you win, the Philistines will be your slaves. And if I win, then you will serve the Philistines. And no Israeli soldier wanted to take him on single-handedly. It was a very intimidating situation. It brought fear to the entire camp of Israeli soldiers. Among those soldiers were some of David's brothers. And so his father, Jesse, had sent him with some food and a care package down to the battlefield to give to his brothers. And as David, a young man full of vim and vigor and victory, having been in the presence of God a number of times in those green pastures, singing, writing songs, taking care of his sheep and seeing God in the meadows and everything, seeing God in nature, seeing God in the enemies that would come against him and how the Lord would give him victory over the bears and the lions. He comes down into this situation. And as this man is roaring this challenge and he watches all of the Israeli soldiers running and hiding in their tents and it bothered him. David had an anointing on him. He had a boldness that was unmatched. And so he says, who is this guy? And they tell him and after a while, there's a small crowd of people gathered around and the brothers come over there and they scold him for coming up there and making all these soldiers look bad. Perhaps if you had been there and you didn't have the benefit of hindsight like you and I do today, thousands of years later, we would have joined in the pack of who does this little naive kid think that he is coming up here and saying, I'll fight the giant. Certainly that would be a suicide mission for a young teenager that never had any experience of being on this kind of a battlefield. But in David's mind, it was a simple equation. And so he asked the rhetorical question, is there not a cause to him and that, that defined the purpose? And if there was a purpose, then God would give him the power. It was simple to David, but it was much more complicated to those around him. So they sent him up to King Saul. Maybe King Saul can deal with him. And he goes up there and he describes. And Saul's really curious about this young man because there wasn't anybody else that was lining up to fight this giant. So David goes up there and explains. And he says, well, at least let, you know, let me give you my armor. And, you know, David, out of respect, tries that, but it's too big. It's cumbersome. He hadn't earned it. He, he doesn't feel that's right. And finally he just says, oh, King, God gave me what I needed to kill a bear and a lion when they came after the sheep. He'll do the same thing for this giant. And so King Saul wishes him well, knowing, you know, in his mind that he'll never see him again. And so they send him off to the battlefield, and there they are on the opposite ends 
of the valley of Elah, and here comes Goliath shouting these challenges one more time. And David comes running down the hill with his little sling, you know, and he stops at a brook and gets five stones, you know, and puts one in a sleet and a, in, a, in the leather sling, as it were, and a little pouch. And, and he comes up there, and, and then the giant sees him. He's insulted that this little boy would come. What do you, what do you think? I'm a dog? You're going to chase me with sticks? David says, you come to me with a spear and a sword and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. Today, he's going to give me the victory. And before long, he is swinging that little leather sling above his head with a rocket, praying in faith and, and speaking the declaration of victory. And then he launches that missile, the first guided missile. Long before GPS, there was heaven PS. I'm not even sure what that means, but God's been guiding things for a long time. And that little rock, that missile finds its mark right in the forehead of Goliath, right where the, the armor of the helmet comes together. There's a gap and somehow that rock finds that one spot and hits that giant right in the spot of his forehead. And that giant, that mountain of a man with all of that armor clanking around and all of that strength and height and girth, and it all comes crashing down like a building being demolished. And David now is running to the giant. He's like, he's down, he's down. And then he grabs the giant's own sword that's fallen to the side. And then he can't even hardly pick it up, the thing, it takes two hands. It's so big, most men couldn't even carry it. And he takes that sword and somehow it gets it up and allows gravity to help him and it falls down and slices that giant's head off as it is uh, razor sharp and then he stands up probably up on the chest of that giant and holds up uh, for everybody to see that severed head with blood still dripping off of the bottom of it and he holds it up high for all of Israel to see and for all of the Philistines to see and when they see it it's mass pandemonium Ooh. The Israelites begin to chase the Philistines and David becomes a national hero. But it does not stop there. David is a warrior and he battles for Israel in a way that Israel has never seen before. He slays literally thousands of enemy soldiers. In fact, he's put in charge as a young man. He is put in charge of all of the men of war. Every one of them. He becomes the leader of the entire elite army of Israel. At one point, he's asked to slay 100 enemy soldiers, and the Bible said he slays 200 enemy soldiers. Now that right there is the formula on how to be successful in life. Now, no matter what the, your employer, your friend, your spouse, whatever they ask you to do, do twice as much. I'm gonna tell you right now, you'll be in charge. It won't take long and you're gonna be in charge because that's the formula for success. Most people only do minimum daily requirement, but champions go above and beyond in everything they do. David is not afraid of a battle. He has to battle in a lot of other battles. It's not just killing men. It's not just uh, the battle of hand-to-hand -hand combat. He has to battle to protect his own spirit. He has to battle the jealousy of King Saul as it overtakes him. He has to battle for his own life when his men turn against him uh, in the sorrow of their own pain with their homes and families uh, being raided by the Amalekites at Ziglag. David and his men uh, pursue. They capture the bad guys and restore their homes uh, and their families because David had to learn uh, that you got a battle you got a battle you got a battle and can I remind you today my friend uh, that you're gonna have to fight for what is valuable to you I said you're gonna have to battle for what is valuable to you you're gonna have to fight for your own soul you're gonna have to fight for your salvation you're gonna have to fight for your own integrity nothing is going to be handed to you and this salvation is not cheap a man or a woman decides that they're going to stand for righteousness you better know it's going to be a battle it's going to be a battle god will help you but you have to fight for yourself i mentioned it at the close of our sunday night service the week before last and 
I was down south of Brother Morgan and we were snorkeling. We had got down in the ocean and where we had started was kind of in a cove and we couldn't tell how rough the ocean waters were. And we were trying to snorkel out uh, on a little trail that went down beyond these ragged rocks that were sticking up. But as we got close to there, we had gotten out of the protection of that cove and we'd gotten out there where these big four and five and six foot swells were coming at us. And, and I felt like if I could just get around the point, uh, and then the current would work for me and would push me uh, back to shore on the other side of these, these rocky outcroppings that were uh, coming up out of the ocean. But as we tried to get around the point of it, we were swimming as hard as we could, but it would only be like a foot forward, and then we'd uh, get washed back two feet, and then we'd try to go another. Isn't life like that sometimes? It's like one step forward and two steps back. And, now, and we were working, and so I said in my mind, I've, I've just got to power through this because I've got to get through this one right on the point. Oh, here comes these swells, and my uh, equipment was all faulty, and I had a cheap mask on, and, and my snorkel was taking on water, and it was just a combination of things. Do you know most of the time when you face a disaster, it's a combination of things? Most airplanes that crash, it's not because of one single incident or one single malfunction. It's a combination of things. Bad weather and, and the gauge is malfunctioning and the pilot's not got enough sleep or whatever. It's usually a combination of things. And so here uh, we were, the perfect storm. Everything had come together to create a catastrophe. And so I was determined, I, you just got to power through it. You got to power through it. You got to power through it. And so I'm swimming as hard as I can, as hard as I can, as hard as I can, as hard as I can. And I look and I'm not getting anywhere and finally I'm just like I'm out of breath I'm exhausted I don't know what to do so I holler as these waves are coming in and crashing on us and crashing on the rocks and and we can't stop the rock there's nowhere to stop there's nowhere to we're way out it's way over our head and we don't have life preservers on and, and I'm just struggling for every breath and and fight and finally I holler out to brother Morgan and I said I need help and he said, okay, well, let's go back. Well, I knew when we went back, we were going to have to go back against that current. And I wanted to get around on the other side, but I was in no position to argue. And I said, okay. And so he grabs me by one arm. He's much younger and much better shaped than I am. Thank the Lord for Brother Morgan. I said, if nothing else, Brother Morgan, always know you saved this old preacher's life. He grabbed me by one arm and he started swimming with his other arm and I was swimming with my one arm that was still good and it was just like, a, a, like an old floppy wing that had been wounded. There was nothing there. And, I, <laughs> and my feet, we had some little old, tiny, little tiny flipper thing we'd rented. It was like we had paper plates taped to our feet. It was the worst equipment ever. And they were just useless and we're just fighting and fighting and fighting and, I, and I'm trying to breathe and trying to breathe and trying to breathe and I kept you know trying to keep air in these lungs and I'm struggling for every breath and I'm trying to make it and I'm fighting and I'm fighting and I'm fighting and I'm thinking you can't give in to fear you can't give in to fatigue and I'm and I'm reminded of what an instructor told me back in the 80s or it may have even been the early 90s but way back there when I did training for scuba diving down in South Florida. I remember we had gotten all in the middle of a pool when we first got all this equipment and we had these vests on and you know you have weights you know on the vest so that you could you know overcompensate for the buoyancy that's naturally in your lungs and you can dive and then they had all them. We had a big tank on our back. We had a regulator and these vests, BP vests and all this and mass door and we were all in the middle of this pool and they were starting us in the pool and then the next day we'd go to the ocean and as we're there and I got all my stuff, water's in my mask and I'm trying to get all situated so I just swim over to the side of the pool and I got my arm over there and I'm trying to get on my mat and the instructor says what are you doing and I said I just swam over here to hold on to the side so I get all my equipment he said Mr. Myers the ocean has no sides <laughs> and he said I said okay and I knew what he was telling me there's gonna come a time when you're gonna have to figure it out and you're not gonna be able to rest you're gonna have to figure it out on the fly you're gonna have to make it and you got to stay in control of your mind and, and, and if you panic the water wins and so all that stuff comes rushing to my head and I'm trying to fight. The ocean has no signs. There's nowhere to stop. Just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep working. Just keep working. You can't rest. You can't recalibrate. You got to figure out how to do it. You're in the middle of the ocean. You're fighting for your life. But thank God there's somebody there trying to help you and we're working together. And then he's exhausted. So then he switches to his other arm. And now he's paddling with his other arm. And for 30 minutes, we didn't know if we were going to make it. Obviously we did. I'm standing here. But these words came rushing back to me as I was fighting to keep my head on straight. And I'm fighting for the air in my lungs. 
the thing that came back to me was the thing that had been said to me all of those years before and that is this if you ever get in trouble just keep swimming swimmers swim and if you ever get in trouble just keep swimming you were made to swim you were made to float you were designed to swim so just swim and those thoughts are in my head and I'm like come on you can do this you were designed to swim just keep swimming even though all the conditions around me were telling me you're not gonna make it in the back of my mind just keep swimming I want to tell somebody today in this building you were made to overcome I don't care what the conditions are. I don't care what your past is. I don't care what the mistakes are. I've come to tell somebody you were designed to overcome. So just keep swimming. Just keep praying. Just keep going to church. Just keep believing. You were not designed to fail. You were not created to fail. You were made for the purpose of succeeding. You were made for victory. You have in your DNA the tenacity to battle, to fight for your soul, to fight for your life. So keep on fighting because we are kings and priests in the Lord and kings go to battle. I said kings go to battle. You say, but old pastor, I've got a carnal nature. Yes, you do, but you've also got a spiritual nature. And now you've got the Holy Ghost. My God, it's not even a fair fight. If you say, devil, you've thrown everything at me. I'm fighting swells. I'm fighting trouble at home. I'm fighting trouble on every side. But God's given me something to let me know that if I just keep battling... You can make it. You say, how do we battle in the spirit world? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. If you're going to serve God, you better know you got an enemy. You better know there's an opposition, and you can't always see the opposition. But you're fighting against principalities. You're fighting against powers and the rulers of darkness and against spiritual wickedness in high places. So here's what you got to do. Take on to you the whole armor of God. That you may be able to withstand in that evil day. And having done all to stand. Sometimes the biggest battle is you just got to take a stand. I refuse to go the way that everybody else is going. I refuse to do what's easiest, to take the path of least resistance. I'm going to stand for righteousness. I'm going to stand for purity. I'm going to stand for biblical principles. Why? Because kings go to battle. I said kings go to battle. This ship of Zion is not a cruise ship. It's a battleship. I said it's a battleship. You've got the weapons to win this battle, but you've got to engage in the battle. You've got to stand your ground. I refuse to give in. I refuse to quit. I'm not going back. I've made up my mind. This is who I am. This is how I choose to live. If everybody on this planet stops serving God, bless God, I'm still going to make it. One day i got to get to heaven. Sometimes you feel like it's one step forward and two steps back. But here I am. I'm still in the house of God. I'm still lifting up my voice. I'm still declaring the glory and the greatness of God. Kings were designed to battle, to battle. As young men are training to be Navy SEALs in San Clemente Island on the outskirts of San Diego. They put them through something called Hell Week. Hell Week consists of five and a half days of cold, wet, brutally difficult, 
operational training on less than four hours of sleep. Five and a half days on less than four hours of sleep of some of the harshest conditions that man can go through. It is designed to test mental toughness, physical endurance, pain, and cold tolerance. And it is designed to train men that in the fog of war can still come out victorious. And the men that are able to get through it, the men that are able to survive it, which are not that many, at some point, they all say the same thing. You have to focus all of your mental and emotional energy on a single determination. I am not going to quit. As long as I'm alive, I'm not going to ring that bell that they ring when they're all done. I can't take it anymore. The ones that make it say, until I can't breathe, until I've got an injury that won't allow me to take one step forward, I'm going to keep on trying because I refuse to quit. Can I tell you that the natural illustrates the spiritual? There's going to be times when you go through things, you feel spiritual fatigue, you don't feel like you can make it one step forward, you got to just make up in your mind, I'm not going to quit. As long as there's breath, there is life. And as long as there's life I'm gonna bless the Lord oh my soul you got to get some tenacity is that all you got devil I'm still here you say oh but I've had a bad week well congratulations welcome to this spiritual journey called Christianity it's a battle. You've had a bad week. You got to come to the house of God and say, Devil, is that all you got? It didn't work. I'm still here. Bless God. Job said, No, he slay me. Yet will I trust him. You go ahead. You throw everything you got. But as long as there's life, I'm going to say, Bless the Lord. I'm going to exalt his holy name because he's worthy of the praises of his people. Jesus, Jesus. Shoko tarabosi. Woo, glory. Sometimes your best offensive weapon is a defensive weapon. I may not be making great strides right now, but I'm still standing. I may not be gaining ground right now, but I'm still standing. David said to Goliath, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a shield. That's three weapons. Two were offensive and one was defensive. A sword was an offensive weapon. It was a sign of battle. A spear was an offensive weapon and it was in proportion to the size of the man. Goliath's spear was so big, the Bible says it was the size of a weaver's beam. It was like a log, a huge weight. The shield was so big that another man carried it. Goliath wanted both of his hands on the offensive weapons and the thing that was meant to protect him was being carried by another. Can I say to this great congregation, don't delegate your defensive weapons. Ephesians says this, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Uh, but verse 16 says, above all. Everybody say, above all. Above. Number one priority. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Uh, you can have all the armor on, uh, but don't offload uh, the shield of faith. Whatever you do, uh, don't lose faith. Keep your shield. I said keep your shield. Uh, don't offload your protection. Don't outsource your defense. Uh, don't let somebody else handle your shield. You better keep that shield of faith. Uh, your mama and your daddy can't save you. Your friends can't save you. Your spouse can't save you you gotta handle that shield by yourself you gotta hold it and you gotta say I'm still in the fight I'm still in the battle cuz I've still got faith as much as David was a warrior he got too comfortable blessings of God became toxic to his defenses when Kings go to battle 
David stayed home and he sent Joab. He sent the army of Israel. I've fought enough battles. I've trained these guys. They can fight the battle now. They don't need me. They can do it without me. They may be able to, David, and certainly they did. And it may be that they can win without you, and they did. But if you don't remember anything else that I say today, remember this. Even if the battle does not need you, you need the battle. Yes, the church can make it without you at prayer meeting, but you need the prayer meeting. Yes, the work of God goes on whether or not you witness, but you need to witness. Because kings go to battle. Yes, there are others that can teach home Bible studies, but you need to teach a, a home Bible study. Because kings go to battle. Church was never designed for us to come and sit in comfortable seats and for some show to be presented for us and us throw our little tip in the offering and think that somehow we are doing what God called us to do. God has called us to be kings and to be priests and to war for the gospel of Jesus. Yes, there are people that can pray for others at the altar. But you need to pray for others at the altar. Because kings go to battle. Well, let the ministers do it. Let the staff do it. Let those that enjoy do it. Those that like the attention, let them do it. I'll just stay here on the perimeter. Oh, my friend, you need the battle. It was during this time of leisure when other people in the kingdom were fighting that David committed this sin of adultery with Bathsheba and then the murder of one of his best men to try and cover his sin. None of it would have happened if David would have gone to battle, if he would have stayed engaged in the fight. Can I tell you something today? You don't ever graduate from the fight, my friend. My father is 86 years old. He's been preaching the gospel for 70 years. He still has to read his Bible. He still has to pray every day. He's still teaching the word of God on Wednesday nights. Because you don't ever graduate from the battle. You say, but oh, this is a good-sized church and there's other people on staff that are paid to do it. Why do I have to do it? Because you were designed for the battle. You think you were just given the Holy Ghost to be your own personal goosebump machine? No, my friend, you were given power to be a witness. You want to see Palm Bay saved? It's going to be with the saints of God. Go to battle and get up every day and say, who can I tell today about the gospel of Jesus Christ? He would have just stayed engaged in the battle. David, 99.9% .9 of your life is success stories. Except this one time that you delegated the fight to somebody else. Oh, my friend, it's a fight. But it's a good fight of faith. I said it's a good fight of faith. You may think it's easier to just stop Pastor, I'm just not a good fighter. I just, I just want peace. How long do you think America would have peace if we just quit fighting, sold our military and scrapped everything? How long did it take in Afghanistan? Days? Hours? Minutes? You don't have peace except for some people that have sacrificed their own life in the blood of their sons and daughters so that you and I can gather 
the freedom of religion and the freedom of a symbol and come together today it's because somebody battled for it if you ever stop fighting you'll start fighting another battle that you cannot win if you stop fighting the battle that you were designed for you'll start fighting a battle you were not designed for and those Navy SEALs quit and they just say we can't take it anymore we're at the end and they ring that bell which most of them do as soon as they do they get warm clothes they get dry and they get to go to sleep there's nobody yelling in their face anymore there's nobody cussing them out anymore Telling them what a low life there is. There's no more screams from bodies that are chafed with cold and what. There's no more pain. But for the rest of their life, they fight with the thoughts of what could have been. They have to live with the regret of quitting. Yes, David, it would have been inconvenient for you to go to battle with your men. You've gotten used to the palace. It's more comfortable there with all of the silk and all of the pillows and you strolling around on the rooftop looking over your gardens. But for the rest of your life, you read about it in your Bible. You're going to live with the pain of sin. Your family paid a heavy price, David. Your kids paid a heavy price, David. You would have heartache, regret, and sorrow. For the rest of your days what happened David you could sit down and have a conversation with him he would tell you the same thing that I tell you today I was a king and kings go to battle I know it's a lot of stress sometimes my friends sometimes just making ends meet it's a lot of work it's a lot of pain a lot of discomfort it takes a lot of work to just hang in there and keep working Keep supporting your family. Keep working on your marriage. It just seems like you take one step forward and two steps back. It looks like it'd be a lot more fun to just run off with that girl at work that laughs at your jokes and brings you coffee in the morning. It'd be a lot easier. I'm just tired of the fight. We'll just run off together and we'll leave all the trouble behind. No, my friend, don't take the bait. You will leave a battle you were designed to win for a struggle that will steal your soul one day at a time. You will watch your family disintegrate. You will serve a taskmaster called regret that is relentless and you'll try to cover it up with fake smiles plastered on social media, but you can't get away from yourself from the voices of what if, what if, what if. Try to massage the pain with money. But money cannot heal the hurt, and money cannot restore the innocence. Don't give up on a battle you were designed to win, or a struggle that you cannot win. Fight the good fight of faith. Keep your flesh in submission. Listen to the Holy Ghost that's telling you, danger, 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 danger. Don't leave the protective cove of the church. You're going to get in deep waters. Fight for your family. Fight for your salvation. Fight for your faith. You say, I don't think I can do it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You are kings and priests. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. And I'm tired of the devil disqualifying good people by putting in your head and in your mind that you can't be used of God. I say the devil is a liar. You're a king and a priest, and you can be used of God. 
but you got to engage in the battle. I said, you got to engage in the battle. You were called for such a time as this. Joseph, why don't you tweak your convictions a little and play the game? Learn how to leverage your political connections so you can make things a little easier for yourself. Aren't you tired of the false accusations? Aren't you tired of the prisons? Aren't you tired of the betrayal of friends? Yes, I am tired, but I have a dream. I said, I got a dream. One day, it's going to be worth it all. One day, I'm coming up out of this prison. You can't see it. All you see is prison garments. But there's royalty that's in these robes. There is kingship that is in this dungeon. And one day, I'm coming out. Kings go to battle before they ever become king. In fact, they become king because of the battle. It's the battle that brings the promise of fulfillment. It's the struggle that brings about the miracle. Hey, Daniel, why don't you just learn how to fit in? Why don't you just learn how to play the game? You know, you're not in Israel anymore. That praying three times a day may have worked, but you know, Israel was taken captive. You're in Babylon now. You're fortunate enough the king has shown you some favor. But you need to graduate with the times. You need to do away with some of these old-fashioned disciplines that you've had. Like praying three times a day. What good has that done? You really don't need to do that anymore, Daniel. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I'm going to battle what I was designed for. So that I can win the battle that I'm not strong enough for. I said, you got to battle what you were designed for so that you can win the battle that you were not designed for. I'm going to battle my flesh now and pray three times a day so that when I'm put in a battle that I wasn't designed for, like a den of lions, uh, that I can't win on my own. uh, But because uh, I won the battle of my own flesh, uh, God said, I'll fight the battle you can't fight uh, because you fought the battle that you could fight. You say, Pastor, there's a lot of stuff that's out of my control. There may be, but if you do, what's in your control? You say, what's in my control? I can lift my hands and bless the Lord even though I'm tired and weary in my body. I can get up out of my seat of comfort and I can come to an altar of repentance even though it'd be easier to stay in the back and to make my way to the car. No, I come to the house of God because I come to battle. I come to say, devil, you're not going to take my family. You're not going to take my marriage. You're not going to steal. Oh, I wish I had a church that would battle. Daniel, because you refuse, you can stand. Daniel, because you refuse to shut your mouth. God shut the mouths of your enemies. You see, if you will battle with what you were designed to battle for, God will battle what you can't. And one day, one day, Daniel, we're up against a situation we don't know how to handle. Can you tell us what does it mean? There's a big hand writing on the wall. Meeny, meeny, tickle, you farson. What does that mean? It means you've been weighed in the balances. And you have been found wanting. That's beautiful, Daniel. What a beautiful sermon. We want to take up a special offering for you. We want to give you a robe and a ring. We want to promote you. You're so eloquent. You know what Daniel said? You can keep it. Because tonight your kingdom's going to be taken away from you. 
And I'm going to sell my soul for a kingdom that's got a few more hours. You really going to sell your soul for this world? This whole world is grappling with the concept that COVID's not going away. The mark of the beast is right on our doorstep. And they're looking to the church. I got a call today or this week from the mayor of Palm Bay. He said, Pastor Dave, what are you feeling for the direction of our city? I told him what I thought. He said, how do you feel spiritually? I said, I feel like Palm Bay can become a spiritual powerhouse that can take dominion over this entire area. He said, do you feel that in the Holy Ghost? I said, I do. He said, I want you to be on a committee and I want you to set the direction for our city. And here's my personal cell number. I only say that as an example that God is at work, my friend. Nobody can deny what's happening inside this building at East Wind Pentecostal Church. Nobody can deny the power and the authority that's reverberating throughout this city. You know why? Because God has called us for such a time as this. Are you going to sell your inheritance for a one-night fling? Are you going to give up on this? Because you don't want to fight anymore? Oh, my friend. Victory is right within our grasp. It's right there. You say, but oh, pastor, I don't know how to deal with the pain in my heart. Just win the war on worship. Go to war with your worship. Determine that you're going to worship anyhow. You say, but I don't feel the joy to worship. Worship anyhow. Worship until your disappointment gives way to deliverance. Worship anyhow. You say, oh, but I got this feeling of hopelessness. Then just win the battle of humility. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and come to an altar of repentance. You say, I don't know how to fight this battle of insecurity. Find somebody else to pray for. Get the focus off of yourself. Get bold. Get determined. There's something that's happening in this church over the last few weeks as the church body is beginning to minister to each other. I think that's the future. I think there's going to be something happen that we've never seen before when the body of Christ begins to minister to one another. Come on, we've been in our little private concaves long enough. It's time to come out of the cave. It's time to pray and to speak the voice of faith over one another. You were made for this. You were made for this. You were made for this. Come on, kings and priests. Get determined. Oh, but I feel guilty. I feel like a hypocrite. Stop feeling and start doing. Get your hands in the air. Open up your mouth. Salvation is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, kings and priests. It's time to suit up. It's time to put on the helmet of salvation. If you've never received the Holy Ghost, it's time to go to war with the flesh. I'm not leaving here until I'm filled with the Spirit of God. As you come down to this altar, I want you to begin to believe. I want you to begin to confess your sins. And I want you to ask God for a double portion of the Spirit of God. I want you to make a determination right now. I'm going to leave a new creature in Christ Jesus. Come on, I'm not going to make any more excuses. I have no more justification. God, by your blood, you have made me to be a king and a priest. And from this day forward, I enlist in the battle. You can count on me. You can count on me. 
I'm going to worship. I'm going to pray. I'm going to humble myself. Come on, all over this building, lift up your hands and lift up your voice. In the name of Jesus.
Oh